We're, we're not very good at, at talking about why art and culture matter, and I think one reason why we're not good at it is that we do so primarily to make a case for public funding. That's why we talk about it. And so the cultural sector has, for about 20 years, talked about issues it believed the government of the day wanted to hear, about economic impact, about creative industries, urban regeneration, benefits to health, social inclusion, community cohesion, and all of that. And so the cultural sector's value became entwined with other agendas. Uh, and it felt it had to make its case for public funding in terms different from that of the cultural experience itself. Under New Labour, this became much, even more intense, and other benefits became the driver of the investment in, in art and culture, provoking Grayson Perry's wonderful ceramic response. Um, in 2007, this pond would reduce crime by 29%, which I think is the perfect response, better than all the arguments one mounted against, against that policy is that. Well, in 2012, the Arts and Humanities Research Council asked me to direct a major project on cultural value. I insisted when asked to do it that it shouldn't be an advocacy report, but it should look seriously at the claims made for arts and culture and test them against the evidence, and that's what we did. I also insisted on looking at all arts and culture, and not just that which is taxpayer-supported, but the commercial and the amateur, which are, after all, the great bulk of people's cultural engagement. We drew on 70 projects that we funded and a very extensive international research literature. And Patricia Koshinska, who worked with me on it, and I published our report uh, last year. Um, I commend all 200 pages to you, uh, but there's an executive summary for the faint-hearted. <laughs> People have really welcomed the report, I think, because they, they, there's a, a sense in which one of the things they welcome is it's giving much more attention to people's actual experience of arts and culture, what it does for them, and the way that links to many other benefits, to the economy, to towns, health, education, we don't deny that those were there, but often it's people's experiences um, that drive it. Um, and if we embrace individual experience, as we do, we allow, that allows us to also embrace um, new perspectives, one of which I've called the reflective individual. The ability of arts and culture to help shape reflective individuals, facilitating greater understanding of themselves and their lives, increasing empathy with respect to others, and helping in appreciation of the diversity of human experience and cultures. That is one of the great things that art and culture um, contribute to society. And it's not, it's not an insist insistence on intrinsic value. We don't argue for art for art's sake. No, it highlights a key benefit to society that comes from engagement with art and culture. And the report considers a great deal of evidence. In the brief time that I've got for just this one part of the report, I can only highlight a few examples and fairly rapidly, but a real analysis will take a lot longer. But let me run through some examples. A project with young cancer sufferers explored how art helped them make and unmake the scripts through which they gave sense to their own lives. A bing-bong ringtone was one result devised by young patients as part of an art project uh, a bing-bong ringtone. It was an amusing take on the warning noise that drove them all mad whenever the infusion machine delivering their medication went wrong. The ringtone evoked complex responses from visitors to the project's exhibition. One isn't meant to laugh about young people with cancer, and visitors asked themselves why they did laugh at it. Or there's its role in the professional development of medical practitioners. A reading of Oscar Wilde's parable, The Doer of Good, in which a figure walks through a beautiful city, encountering the ambivalent results of his earlier good deeds, was used to stimulate GP registrars to discuss their attitudes to consent and to duty of care in a way that they would never have done as thoughtfully nor as openly had they been asked to address the topic head on. Their understanding that wishing to do good isn't always the same as doing it led them to a discussion of all the hay and the retention of deceased children's organs. They would never have got there without Oscar Wilde's parable prompting them. Focus on reflection this way might seem to um, privilege the cognitive over the affective dimensions of cultural experience, but a real understanding has to grasp the interaction between the two. An ethnographic study of the Grand gest Gestures Elders Dance Group in Gateshead uh, shows this. This group comprises 14 people aged between 60 and 90 who take their improvisatory dance into public spaces. And the participants, when asked to talk about it, said that the affective experience of dancing 
shifted their self-identity. The difference, they thought, between the self that they perform for others every day and the more authentic self, they say, they experience in the absorption of the dance sessions. And then there's the Readers' Organisation Shared Reading Scheme. 360 groups across the UK, damaged people with histories of addiction and abuse and with a limited experience in literature beforehand, read, al read aloud to each other from a novel or a poem, and they come back every week to keep that going. And that, that reading aloud provided points of departure for discussing their own lives, with the trigger often coming in really powerful literary fashion from a word or a phrase that started somebody talking. In so many examples, the doctors I've referred to, the participants in the shared re reading, is the experience through aesthetic distance. This is not real, but it feels as though it is, that allows reflection on difficult topics, and surely it does that for all of us. Well, the arts are widely used in prison, um, where a mass of initiatives include theatre companies such as Geese Theatre and the Kirchner Trust Art and Creative Writing Competitions. These have been, that's one of the winning paintings um, from, from one of the com uh, Kirchner Trust competition. These have been subject to extensive evaluations, these programmes. Have they reduced reoffending? There's no evidence that they have. Um, but how can being in a drama or art group when in prison stop you reoffending when you've got all the problems of, of not having a job, your partner having left you and nowhere to live when you emerge from prison? Um, but it does, however, seem to start a journey towards desistance. The process of personal growth through which an offender shifts their identity towards being a non-offender. Desistance is now the mainstream approach in criminology to re-offending, and it requires an ability to think about oneself and others, to see genuine choices, to imagine other life circumstances. Art enables them to do that. Art practice, cultural practice. Art introduces uncertainty and ambiguities and silences in a prison environment where these are not present. It introduces options where none seemed available. And there's significant evidence of its role in shifting a set offenders' sense of themselves and their relation to others, which begins the process of becoming a non-offender. I've called this talk, asked in this talk's title about reflectiveness and empathy. So let me shift to empathy, which really is connected to reflectiveness. Theory of mind is one dimension of this. Theory of mind um, describes our capacity to comprehend that people other than ourselves have minds of their own. They have mental states. They hold beliefs, responses, and emotions that may not be identical to our own. Work using drama and film and photography and museums and music has all been found to facilitate empathy and literature. A fascinating experiment by psychologists in the United States found that reading literary fiction, literary fiction, as opposed to non-fiction, popular fiction, or nothing at all, all in the experiment they set up, led to better performance on tests of both affective and cognitive theory of mind. People had a better sense of how to interpret other people's, in this case, facial states, which was the, the, um, um, the experiment. There's a related power of art to break down assumptions about the other. We can see this in an exhibition of Nick, Nick Danziger's photos of daily life in North Korea, in North Korea. He was permitted by the government to come in and take formal photos, formal photos. But when his government minders were distracted, and actually the British Council person with him played the role of distracting them, when the government minders were distracted, he took the one photos he really wanted. Look at this photo of young women. Or this one of women in a hairdressing salon. We think of North Koreans as people ground down by one of the world's most oppressive regimes. Danziger's photos don't in any way deny the horrors of the regime, but they restore their humanity to the people of North Korea. They're real people, like you and me. Art, whether it's visual art, theatre, literature, music, can do that, reminding us that others are complex, real people, not stereotypes. Well, as these examples show, empathy and understanding of the other is one of the most powerful benefits that arts engagement brings to society. And I could have given you a lot more. No wonder that it's been used to help develop empathy amongst professional carers. A network of reading groups for medical and nursing staff at US veterans hospitals, for example, played a major role in the staff's ability to handle with empathy the traumatized patients that they worked with every day. And such methods have been used to support staff caring for people 
uh, living with a dementia. And when care staff are themselves involved in the arts practice for residents, something really interesting emerges. A systematic study tested the impact of something called a program called Time Slips. Time Slips uses photo and word problems to draw people with dementia into storytelling. The main focus of Time Slips and of this particular test uh, evaluation was the residents, but ethnographic observation two weeks after the interventions had ended showed that the care staff who had participated in the program showed much higher levels of social interaction with the residents. Interaction based on respect, not just responsibility, compared with those in the control group homes. The quality of basic care was the same for those who'd been in the art program or those who'd been in a control group home. But those in the, who worked with the, with, with the residents in the art program looked residents in the eyes when speaking to them. They listened to their responses. They offered invitations not commands to them. The residents' humanity had been restored in the eyes of the carers through working with them in an art program. All I've been able to do in 10 minutes is point you towards this powerful effect of engagement with the arts. Why arts and culture have this effect um, would require another talk. And we'll consider issues such as aesthetic distance and theory of mind, both of which I've mentioned, and the existence of mirror neurons in the brain, which I haven't. But of one thing I'm certain, the ability of engaging with arts and culture to influence reflectiveness and empathy is one of its most powerful effects and one of its most socially important ones. Our report was written before the successes of a new populist politics resting on slogans and certainties. But the capacity of the arts to engender nuance, questioning and appreciation of the other is surely even more needed today. And here surely is one of the most important benefits that arts and culture brings to our society.